Okay, so if you've been following, uh, we just had the evolution of prokaryotic cells, the first living things on Earth, and they eventually evolved the ability to photosynthesize, possibly as early as about 3.5 billion years ago. And so the oxygen, as I mentioned, uh, was first released into the oceans, bound to iron, that, but then eventually free oxygen became available in the oceans, um, and then in the atmosphere approximately 2.2 billion years ago. And that drove this event that's known as endosymbiosis. So the endosymbiotic theory is what we're looking at here. And what it tries to explain, and again, this is through inference, because we don't have a time machine to go back and see how this happened, but the idea is this is where eukaryotic cells came from. So the first living things were prokaryotic cells, bacteria that don't have a nucleus, and then we see the appearance of eukaryotic cells, and we think this is how prokaryotic cells came together through endosymbiosis to create or give rise to eukaryotic cells. There's a lot of information on here, so I'm just pretty much going to go down the list of uh, the notes that are going to come up just to keep me from going off on, on a tangent and talking too much. Um, so when oxygen was added to the oceans and atmosphere, that was poison, as I mentioned on the previous slide, to a lot of the organisms that were alive at that time. And again, these are prokaryotes, bacteria, that had evolved without oxygen. So they couldn't handle the oxygen. So they either went extinct or they adapted. In this diagram, <clears throat> you'll notice the archaeal ana anaerobic prokaryote. Archaeal refers to um, a certain branch of prokaryotes, one of the first uh, living things on the planet, or some of the first living things on the planet. Archaeal refers to ancient. So these are ancient, anaerobic, referring to not able to handle oxygen, not able to use oxygen. And these, so these are the ones that were in danger of being killed by oxygen and going extinct. The aerobic bacteria would be the, uh, the other branch of bacteria the other branch of prokaryotes, I should say. Um, and these had evolved the ability to handle oxygen through the process of cellular respiration. In other words, they had evolved cellular respiration, which uses oxygen to break down molecules to get energy. That's, in a nutshell, that's what cellular respiration is. The important thing here is, though, that they weren't killed. They were the kind of bacteria that were not killed by oxygen. They actually evolved a way to use the oxygen to their advantage. So the aerobic bacteria came to live inside the archaeal anaerobic prokaryote. And one scenario might be that the archaeal anaerobic prokaryote uh, intended to eat the aerobic bacteria, but then didn't digest it. Once it got inside the aerobic bacteria wasn't broken down and used as food, and that aerobic bacteria just came to live inside the um, archaeal anaerobic prokaryote, and so it just kind of kept it around. And we actually see that happening in cells today. There are uh, amoebas that will take in uh, algal cells and, and not digest them, and uh, just keep them around. And the algae makes food for the amoeba. Um, kind of the same idea here, but in this case, the uh, aerobic bacteria that was taken in would be breaking, using oxygen, protecting the archaeal anaerobic prokaryote from being killed by the oxygen, and making food in the pro or making energy in the process, or, or transforming energy is what I should say in the process. So this would be considered a eukaryote. Um, other membranes, infolding of the plasma membrane is thought to create a, a membrane around the DNA in the cell, which is what's being represented here by what's labeled the nucleus. And other organelles would be created by the infolding of the plasma membrane also, which we also see uh, creating structures in prokaryotic cells today. <clears throat> 
So this partnership is, is mutualistic symbiosis, which is something that we learned about uh, in a previous unit, the, our ecology unit. So it's a form of symbiosis, and it benefits both partners, right? Endosymbiosis is when one of the partners in a symbiotic relationship is inside the other partner. For example, you have bacteria that live in your digestive tract. They are endosymbionts. They are your endosymbionts. So the photo, uh, so notice that there are two branches to this diagram. So this represents one endosymbiotic event that uh, gave rise to eukaryotes that have, mito have mitochondria, which that line still has mitochondria today, and it includes protozoa, the animal like protus, fungi, and animals, including us. But there's another line where endosymbiosis happens again. So because there are two endosymbiotic events going on back-to-back, uh, -back, one after the other, that's a series, right? So we refer to it as serial, serial endosymbiosis. So in this line, that eventually leads to algae and plants, photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms, represented by algae and plants, that line required serial endosymbiosis, where once the endosymbiotic event that um, gave rise to mitochondria in, in eukaryotic cells took place, then we have another endosymbiotic event that gives rise to chloroplasts. And so they have both chloroplasts and mitochondria. Two endosymbiotic events, the first giving rise to mitochondria and the second giving, giving rise to chloroplast, which are photosynthetic. So the idea is that photosynthetic bacteria, like I just mentioned about the amoeba taking an algae and then just keeping the algae around to make food, well, that's what's going on here. The chloroplasts are photosynthesizing, making glucose, which is food um, that the host organism, in this case, could, could uh, take advantage of and use. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the membranes, other organelles then can form or did form from the infolding of the plasma membrane, because all the other organelles are mem very membranous, like and you may, have, may be familiar with some of those endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi bodies. As I also mentioned previously, you have endosymbionts in your body that make up your microbiome. You've got, you've got a lot of bacteria that live in and on your body, and they make up your microbiome, but it's the ones that are inside your body that are endosymbionts, just to get across that, that term, uh, vocabulary term for you. So each of these lines were progenitors of the four eukaryotic king kingdoms. So as we classify living things today, there are four eukaryotic kingdoms, and they're all represented here. Uh, Serial endosymbiosis, again, resulted in algae and, and plants. Algae are photo, uh, photosynthetic protists. <clears throat> um, so that's the kingdom protista, the kingdom plantae. Uh, the non-serial line here that, was, that only involves one endosymbiotic event uh, giving rise to mitochondria leads to protista, which we already identified it here. Uh, but then fungi and animalium. The other kingdoms are prokaryotic, so that accounts for all the kingdoms. The evidence that this happened, because again, this is all inference, uh, the evidence is evidence that mitochondria and chloroplasts were once free living. And you really should know uh, this evidence. I didn't have time, or, or not time, I didn't have space to put it on the slide, as you can see. The slide's pretty packed. But uh, you ought to list these these evidences that suggest that mitochondria and uh, chloroplasts were once free-living organisms. And generally, uh, you know, the, the most obvious thing is they kind of look like bacteria. Their size and structure uh, look like bacteria. When you look at them under the microscope, they're about the same size as bacteria or uh, prokaryotic cells, and they have this, some similar structure to prokaryotic cells. They have their own DNA, 
And that's one of the most important pieces of evidence. Uh, no other organelle has its own DNA. So mitochondria has its own little ring of DNA and chloroplasts have their own little ring of DNA. And it's that structure of the, that DNA that e e looks like uh, prokaryotic DNA also because prokaryotes um, have little rings of DNA. Um, that's what makes up their, they have one single chromosome that is a ring of DNA. And then the last piece is that they, they reproduce inside our cells. And I say our because we are eukaryotes. We're in the animal kingdom and we are eukaryotes. So the mitochondria in your cells reproduce by binary fission, just like prokaryotic cells do, just like bacteria do. Same with chloroplasts. They reproduce inside the cells that have them. They reproduce by binary fission. They just split in two, just like bacteria. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, prokaryotes reproduce by binary fission. They just split in two, which is a form of asexual reproduction. Uh, but with the with endosymbiosis and the evolution of eukaryotic cells, sexual reproduction eventually uh, evolved. And so on this slide, we're comparing the two. So asexual reproduction is reproduction that does not involve gametes. Gametes is the term that refers to sperm and eggs, in other words, sex cells. Uh, so s binary fission is asexual. Budding is another form of asexual reproduction where a smaller individual grows and eventually uh, separates from a parent organism. And fragmentation is when um, an organism is able to survive being cut into pieces and each piece grows into a new individual. That's fragmentation. And that's then, so those are all forms of asexual reproduction, some of the major forms of asexual reproduction. So organisms that reproduce asexually are bacteria and protists. So bacteria being represented by this diagram, split in two, binary fission. Protists represented by this paramecium. You may recognize that as a paramecium. Um, splitting in two, but this type of binary fission is different because it involves the nucleus splitting first. So the nucleus has to divide because it's a eukaryote, it has a nucleus, and the nucleus has to divide before the cell divides. And you may recognize the term that, that describes that process of nuclear division known as mitosis. <clears throat> um, so sexual reproduction involves gametes, the production of sperm and eggs. And those that Reproduce, uh, reproduce sexually are protists, certain protists, so not all protists uh, reproduce by binary fission. There are certain protists that reproduce asexually, and there are some protists that reproduce both sexually and asexually. Most fungi reproduce sexually, and all plants and animals reproduce sexually. But there are some plants and animals, suggested up here, that also reproduce uh, asexually. Invertebrate, there are many invertebrate animals that reproduce asexually as well as sexually. <clears throat> so here we want to compare um, the advantages and disadvantages to uh, between asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. Uh, so asexual reproduction involves only one parent, and that's an advantage, right? It's fast, no gametes, so there's no energy going into producing sperm or egg. Um, high mutation rate, gene shuffling by horizontal transfer, which means there's not a whole lot of gene, gene shuffling. Horizontal transfer is the transfer of genes between, one, between individuals, and that, that ha tends to happen more in bacteria than it does in eukaryotes. In other words, in prokaryotes more than eukaryotes. Um, the offspring tend to be genetically identical to the parent except for possibly some mutation. The advantage is a high rate and, and less energy, a high, high reproduction rate. You know, bacteria can reproduce, like bacteria, certain bacterial species can reproduce every 20 minutes, can undergo binary fission every 20 minutes. For example, the E. coli that's in your digestive tract right now can, under ideal conditions, uh, reproduce every 20 minutes or undergo binary fission every 20 minutes, asexual reproduction. The disadvantage is less genetic variation. The genetic variation is coming primarily from mutation. 
Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, involves two parents, <clears throat> which takes more energy, so that's kind of a disadvantage. You have to uh, find a mate. It involves producing gametes, which uses energy, more energy. It's slower, because again, you have to find a mate, you have to produce the gametes, you have to go through possibly some kind of mating ritual. Um, once the egg is fertilized, it has to undergo development, uh, so it all takes time, so it's slower in general. A slower mutation rate, because reproduction is slower, that means there's less opportunity for mutation. But there's a lot of gene shuffling. So the variation that comes from a, uh, sexual reproduction, which is the major advantage of sexual reproduction, the variation that comes from that is mainly from gene shuffling. In other words, the mother's genes and the father's genes coming together and shuffling together to form a new, unique individual that's different from both parents and different from any other individual of that species, really. So the offspring are genetically different from their parents, which is the advantage. The disadvantage is slower and requires more energy, and, and you have to find mates and produce gametes and all that. So sexual reproduction evolved. I mean, you might be asking yourself, well, why is it that sexual reproduction evolved at all? You know, if, if uh, asexual reproduction is so fast and efficient, well, it's because of the variation. It's all about the variation. And as you know, genetic variation is the raw material of natural selection and evolution. So those organisms that reproduce sexually have an advantage, uh, an evolutionary advantage. Okay, so those were some really important events. Endosymbiosis, the evolution of eukaryotic cells, and the evolution of sexual reproduction. That kind of set the stage for the evolution of more complex life. And here we're looking at just before the Cambrian explosion. So this is still in Precambrian time, but it's at the very end of Precambrian time. If you'll recall, that's the Vendian period. So in the Vendian period, we find fossils, the first fossils of animal life, multicellular animal life, but they're very rare because at that time animals were soft-bodied. They didn't have hard parts. That's that's one reason anyway. And they weren't as numerous. They weren't as uh, widespread. So their fossils are, are relatively rare. But we have found fossils of animals that date back as far as 600 million years, which is long before the Cambrian explosion. Um, when we find all kinds of animal fossils because they evolved hard parts. So a couple examples here. The oldest, uh, some of the oldest fossils are actually micro fossils. So you have to use a microscope to see them, but they represent embryos. These are multicellular animal embryos. And I, I put an image of a frog embryo here so you can make the comparison between this fossil embryo that's 600 million years old and a frog embryo. Um, this one, Dickinsonia is a an animal that is a relative uh, thought to be a relative of annelids. So this is a, a early annelid, <clears throat> which is uh, the phylum, the animal phylum that includes earthworms. So the the lines on here are kind of the same thing as the rings that you see going down the body of an earthworm. They're segmented. They have segments. I should mention, too, that this is at the end of the Proterozoic era. We're about to get, get into uh, the next era, which is the Paleozoic. And the Paleozoic is divided into periods, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and Permian, in that order through time. And we're going to look at these individually on upcoming slides. Um, but the Cambrian is when we see the appearance of animals. And like I said, um, the reason for that being partially being that they had hard parts that fossilized really well. So we call that the Cambrian explosion, the sudden appearance of animals, multicellular animals in, in the uh, fossil record. And as I mentioned, these are periods within, uh, yeah, so just to relate some of these images of different animals to the different periods uh, before we go look at the periods in more in greater detail. 
this guy, this is an Alamanna carid, which is, was thought to be the top level predator back in the Cambrian era, or Cambrian period, I'm sorry. Um, so it was swimming around uh, and, and taking chunks out of biting into and eating uh, trilobites, for example. These guys are, are representing the Ordovician, and uh, I really wasn't able to find good, uh, much better representatives of the Ordovician. But it's just further evolution of uh, arthropods. Uh, these are all; these are both arthropods, um, or all arthropods. They have an exoskeleton, so they fossilize really well. The Silurian, <clears throat> we see the evolution of fish. So these represent some of the most primitive fish, um, and then the Devonian is known as the age of fishes but by the end of the devonian we see the evolution of the first tetrapods so think amphibians this looks like an amphibian right uh, like a salamander uh, so by the end of the devonian the fish have evolved to the point where they can actually leave the water they have legs and can leave the water um, as as the first tetrapods then in the Carboniferous, we see the evolution of reptiles. So certain amphibians uh, have adaptations to allow them to live on land 100% of the time, and we'll get into those details, what those adaptations are, but that would represent the first reptiles. And then in the Permian, we see all kinds of different lines of, <coughs> of reptiles and uh, mammal-like uh, organisms. So we see the beginning of, all, of all, just pretty much all the lines of descent that are going to lead to the animals that we have on the earth today, except at the end of the Permian is the greatest mass extinction that has ever happened, and, and we'll take a look at that uh, further along. So again, uh, we've gone from the Proterozoic era and the, the Vendian period to the Paleozoic era and the Cambrian period being the first period of the Paleozoic. And we see this event known as the Cambrian explosion, all kinds of animals. And this is kind of a neat uh, representation of geologic time. And where we are now in ge geologic time is right here. So we see the expansion here and the kind of organisms that we find in the fossil record from this time. They look really weird and alien-like. But again, they're some of the first animals to have evolved. Uh, this being kind of an artist's snapshot of what it might have been like. I mean, they probably piled a lot more animals into this this um, picture than would actually be there, but it gives you some idea of the variety of animal life that was around at that time. So a better word than explosion would probably be adaptation or radiation. So to call this the Cambrian, Cambrian radiation would be my preferred term, but that's not what we call it. We call it the Cambrian explosion. So all the current animal phyla uh, that are on the earth today got their start back in the Cambrian. So we can find representatives of all the, all the animals that are alive today um, back at, at this time. <clears throat> so they're all invertebrates. There were no vertebrates back in the Cambrian. Um, so mollusks, mollusks and arthropods primarily is what we find in the fossil record. A wide variety of uh, arthropods. We find echinoderms too. Um, that's represented by this this guy right here, uh, sea urchin, like. So that's what the Cambrian looked like. Um, and the next slide kind of shows or depicts the same thing, artist version. And there are a lot of different organisms listed here, but the one that I want you to um, focus on. Is the possible ancestor of vertebrates and therefore the possible ancestor that existed back in the Cambrian of us. And that would be this guy, Pacaya, number 22. Whoops. And number 22 is right here in this photo. So this little swimming worm-like thing um, is possibly our own ancestor that was alive back in the Cambrian. And um, it had something sort of like a backbone called a notochord, uh, which makes it a chordate, which is our own phylum, phylum chordata. Uh, but it didn't have a backbone. It was still an invertebrate. So it had a backbone-like supportive structure, but it didn't have a backbone. 
Here we're looking at the Ordovician and, the Sol and Silurian, and the Ordovician was relatively short, um, so I lumped them together. And uh, each figure here represents uh, a different event. So there are four events here that I'd, I'd like to focus on, um, and it's mainly a continuation of evolution. Uh, you know, that's basically what we're going to be looking at as we go through time here, and we're looking at how life has evolved through time as the Earth, as time passed. Um, so if we determine the events that each period that happened uh, during these periods, we see the continued evolution of aquatic invertebrates. So, you know, if you compare this to the image that we were looking at on the previous slide of the Cambrian period, it m looks much different. We see much more complex um, life. The evolution of the first vertebrates, in other words, fish. So I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but the first vertebrates, the first things to have a backbone were fish. And the idea is that uh, that pacaya like uh, or that that uh, species pacaya on the previous slide um, was the ancestor of fish. And fish are, you know, certain fish are in the same are in the line that leads to us even. We see the evolution of land plants. <clears throat> so algae, uh, certain alg algal species give rise to uh, photosynthetic multicellular eukaryotes that can live on land, and that's what we call a plant. So we see the evolution of the first plants. And the first plants were very simple um, and very small. They weren't vascular, right? Notice that these are the ones that were first to evolve. Hornworts, mosses, liverworts, and you know what mosses look like. You may not be as familiar with hornworts and liverworts, but they're all non-vascular plants, and therefore they can't grow very big. Um, and w finally we see the evolution of terrestrial invertebrates. So the idea here is that plants uh, evolved and were on land, and they served as a food source for animals then to uh, make the move onto land. And as you can see here, there are arthropods, um, but there were also there would also be worms um, and mollusks that would have made it onto land too by this time. Here we are in the Devonian period, and as I mentioned, the Devonians referred to as the age of fishes. But again, by the end of the Devonian, we see the evolution of um, the amphibians, the first tetrapods. Uh, and so we're just looking at, at specific groups here. So. That would be the evolutionary advancement uh, involving the vertebrates. Kingdom plantae also advanced in the evolution of vascular tissue. In other words, plants that were able to, to transport water up from the soil through their, their roots, stems, and, and into their leaves high off the ground. So they're able to grow larger. So we see the evolution of ferns and, and what we call fern allies represented by this figure here. We also see uh, the evolution of arthropods in that they evolved flight and this would represent the evolution of insects which was a, a huge uh, advancement in the evolution of arthropods it, because insects today are the largest animal group within the animal kingdom so it, there are like more insect species than all other species of animals put together so it's a huge evolutionary advancement, the evolution of flight and the evolution of insects in the, in the arthropod group. Because the Devonian is such an important period, um, I added this slide uh, because, again, one of the most uh, significant evolutionary events is the evolution of tetrapods, the amphibians, uh, from fish, even though the Devonian zone is the age of fishes. So fish evolved, eventually evolved the ability to leave the water with legs and lungs, be able to breathe air and walk on land. And so we would classify these guys today as amphibians. In general, they're known as tetrapods, and tetrapods include amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, which are the large animals that, are, that you're mo probably most familiar with. So when you think of an animal, you're probably going to be thinking of a tetrapod. The current understanding of how tetrapods evolved is that they evolved the ability to walk on land while they were in the water. So in other words, they evolved the legs 
and fingers um, in shallow water that they were eventually able to use to leave the water for short periods of time and then eventually leave the water for longer periods of time. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is that just like plants moved on the land before animals moved on the land, uh, kind of the same things going on here, the evolution of insects and, and invertebrates moving on the land kind of, uh, well, so didn't kind of, did uh, provide a food source to drive the evolution of fish to uh, tetrapods that were able to leave the water in, and eat those invertebrates that had uh, evolved to be able to live on land. So it's kind of following a food source and filling available niches that were wide open on land. So here we're in the Carboniferous and Permian periods and I put them both together on the same slide. Uh, during the Carboniferous, it's called the Carboniferous because that's when coal deposits formed. Uh, or that's when the organisms were alive, the, the vast forests of fern-like plants um, that were all over the world. The climate was right all over the world for these vast forests to cover the planet. And they, event and they uh, grew so fast and died and, and uh, fell to the ground and didn't decompose and got buried. Um, and that's what formed the coal deposits that we now dig up and burn as fossil fuels. Um, so that's why we call it the Carboniferous period. And uh, so that's what that says. During this time, during the per Permian period, we see the evolution of the lines of reptiles, different lines, four different lines of reptiles, and they're identified by their the holes in their skull. So you see the anapsids uh, don't have, and means without, so they don't have a hole in their skull other than their eye socket. Uraphids have two holes in their skull, um, one of them being, and the one other than the eye socket is uh, high on the skull. Diapsids, di means two, so there are two holes in the skull other than the eye socket. And then synapsids have only one, but it's lower uh, other than the eye socket. Uh, so the, those different lines uh, include reptile-like reptiles represented here by within the diapsids. So I'm calling them reptile-like reptiles because they are they include the rep <clears throat> that line includes the reptiles that we have on the earth today: crocodiles, alligators, snakes, lizards. They're in that line along with pterosaurs, which weren't dinosaurs, by the way, um, and dinosaurs and birds. So all of them are diapsids. So that line got its start back in the Permian period. Uh, aquatic reptiles like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs were the urapsids, which are now extinct. Dinosaurs and birds, uh, again, are diapsids. <clears throat> birds being the only ones that are surviving today. And the mammal-like reptiles, which is really a, not a good way to refer to them because the line began and branched off so early from uh, reptiles that they are hardly they hardly can be described as reptiles but both of these figures represent uh, what are often referred to as mammal-like reptiles uh, and as you can see they kind of have mammalian characteristics uh, that are familiar to you so again that line is the synapsids uh, and so in our own skull that opening that second opening is right here behind the eye socket and it's a point of muscle attachment for the jaws. Then, dot, 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 there was a mass extinction, the great dying, the largest mass extinction ever found in the fossil record, which marked not only the end of the Permian period, but also the end of the Paleozoic era. Uh, 